Okay. Please court, ladies and gentlemen, counsel. Thank you for all the time you spent with us. I know that's a, been a rough date. Um, can we get the... Yes, Your Honor. On October 21st, after midnight, 2007, the defendant turned his phone off. He turned his phone off so he could drive down to Los Lunas to where his wife was. Drove down, parked his car, got out of the car, looked in the window because he wanted to make sure things were dark and she was not active and up and around. The little light from the TV is on. She's laying in bed. She's been calling nonstop. I mean, you see the phone records. Call. She knows he's having another affair. Calling nonstop. So he comes in the door with his key. No need to break in. Walks in with his gun in his uniform, like he does every time he comes home after work. Walks into the house, walks through, and Tara Chavez is laying in bed probably asleep. You heard Dr. Berman up for 36 hours straight or so with the Benadryl in the system. She would have been very sleepy. But even if she's not totally asleep, I've seen the photos, she's laying there. He's not come home to talk about divorce like she's asked. Finally shows up at the very end. Even if she's awake. Great, nice to see you. But look at the remote. Look how things are set up. Fell asleep watching TV. And then he walks in, but even if she is awake, walks in, takes the gun out, as if to place it down. Walks up and shoves the gun into the back of her mouth and pulls the trigger. She's, got a, she's sick. She's taking cold medicine. Is it a surprise that her mouth is open? No, my wife gets on to me for snoring when I have a cold. Slams that gun in and pulls the trigger, instantly killing Tara Chavez. And then he pulls the gun out, and he turns it over, and he lays it down. And as he does so, he put hand on the magazine release. In a hopped up adrenaline state, he grabs the phone that's laying by her because she's been using it nonstop, and does a quick text. I'm so sad. And then he hops in the shower because he just shot a gun. Somebody might have heard. Well, what's a good excuse for not calling, not reporting? I was in the shower. I didn't hear anything. Then he gets out of the shower. Nothing there. Puts on those shorts. Lays the damp towel over the back of the arm, or the love seat, and goes back and picks up the phone and sends a text. I'm so sad, I'm afraid I'm going to hurt myself. And then it's important that that be found. Not only does he do that, but he deletes the other texts in that phone, because as you see in the admission, there are no other texts, although she sent them by his own statement. She sent multiple texts. There's only those two in her phone. And he walks over and plugs the phone in. Because it needs to be charged and on when the cops get there. Because you know what? You heard him from him. He doesn't know she's called in sick. When she doesn't show up to work the next day, people are going to start looking for her. And he gets back in his uniform, takes off back to Deborah, where he can spend all day with her and have nothing to do with it. Or we can take the whole suicide thing so that she is so depressed that he hasn't come home again that now, after a year, it's done. I'm going to kill myself. And she goes 
and she's clearly laying on bed watching TV. So she gets up, maybe she takes the phone at that point and plugs it in as she gets up to go get the gun. If it's there, it's in the cabinet. So she gets up on the armor, she gets up and go get the gun. Plugs the phone in, comes back to the bed, lays down, and then instead of this, she takes it like this, or more likely, if it's truly upside down, and she shuts it all the way in the back of her mouth. Or, I mean, and look at it, I'm gonna get the real gun, but I'm not putting the real one in my mouth. Huh? Huh? Really? Yeah, obviously, if you're gonna kill yourself, you're not worried about comfort, but you're gonna shove it all the way down your throat? That's what Dr. Berman, oh, it's all the way in the back. Excuse me, Dr. Uh, Wetley. Can't keep the doctor straight either. Um, all the way into the back. <clears throat> What's more consistent if it's going all the way in the back? You doing it yourself or someone else doing it? Oh, but there's no injury to the mouth. Let's talk about that. But look at this gun. Look at it. Well, look at this thing. You get to look at everything, but please. Please take the time to just take a minute. And obviously the gloves are I will do this. But look at this. Look at the size and decide. Really, especially if you're shoving it down your throat. But you know what? The defendant, he's counting on things. The thin blue line. Nobody's ever said in this case that any cop came and intentionally covered up for him. You've heard all the people come through. There's no intentional, but what you have is a fellow brother officer. You have the closing of ranks, like you do with the church, like you do with the military. It's one of your own, and he's telling you it's suicide. And you're feeling awful, and there's nothing when you first walk in that door that says differently. And he's got this down, and oh my God, how can this happen? The officers rally around one of their own. Not to intentionally cover up for him, to intentionally help him out, but on human nature. As Russell Perea says, called by the fans, hey, we're sitting in the same car, and he's, but what he's doing is none of my business. Heather Chavez, among other officers, talk about when an officer tells you, you believe him. That's what he's counting on. He knows growing up in a law enforcement family, being a cop for around three years, he knows they're going to be predisposed to accept one of their own. And credibility is what you look at with every witness. But credibility was also looked at by the officers at the time. And they, he expects them to believe him. He knows that the emotions are running high and that they will help to cloud the case, cloud the issues. His kids are victims. Absolutely, they're victims. Their mother is dead. He's not, but he uses it. Oh my gosh, let's, let's talk about my kids and how I had to tell them. It's awful. That's what you concentrate on. Oh my God. And you stop looking. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't get to stop looking. You, and this is the most important thing in any case, get to use your common sense. You get to go through everything. You get to sit and listen to everybody and sort out what makes sense. 
because the defendant wants the suicide to be no investigation. He knows that's how it plays out as a cop. He tells you he's gone to suicide scenes and he didn't give an F. Turns out, scenes closed that night. Sheets, bad bedding, the mattress cut out, all destroyed. Because, oh, it's a suicide. He tells Joseph Cordova, this will all be over in a week. No more tears for your daughter, all over in a week. You know what? <laughs> he thinks he's committed the perfect murder. Now what is murder? Obviously we all know it's killing someone. The judge read you the instructions and in New Mexico it requires these three elements. The, the state proves beyond a reasonable doubt all three of them. Defendant killed Tara Chavez the killing was with the deliberate intention to take away the life of Tara Chavez, and it happened in New Mexico on or about between the 19th and 21st. It happened on the 21st. And as we walk through this, the state's going to prove each and every one of those. Deliberate intention, long definition. In this case, pretty simple. Cold-blooded, calculated, planned out murder. Not some heat of passion, not a struggle, not an argument fight. Long time coming. And if you've got the murder, you got tampering with evidence, because the gun's laid there to make it look like a suicide. And it's beyond a reasonable doubt. Let me remind you, you heard lots of discussion as to what is reasonable doubt, what is not at the voir dire. Only you get to determine what is a reasonable doubt to each and every one of you. The law presumes the defendant be innocent unless and until you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt. That's important because it's up to each one of you to determine if the doubt you have is reasonable. It's not required that it be proven beyond all possible doubt. Reason and common sense. It's not just, oh, aliens landed. That's not reasonable. Every time a person makes a decision, there's doubt. Is this right, is it not? Go in for open heart surgery. Doctor tells you you gotta do it. Your chest is going to have to be cracked open. You go, no way. And then you're provided evidence, like a trial. Doctor walks you through. This is what I'm, this, these are the tests. This is what I'm doing. OK, doc, that's nice. I need more. So you go to another doctor. You get more tests. That information gets provided to you. And then you make a decision. And as you go to lay on that operating room table, you got lots and lots of doubt. They're going to crack my ribs open. But you made a decision, if you lay on that table, that the doubt you had was no longer reasonable. Because the evidence overcame it. That's the same thing with a trial. Not do you have any doubt, but did the evidence overcome that so that the doubt you have left is not reasonable in your opinion. That 911 call, we know it was made by the defendant. You heard it. You can listen to it as many times as you want if you need to. But remember, basically he says immediately, wife just shot herself. Tells him he's a cop within seconds. Tells him he won't touch her. He won't perform CPR, even though he is an EMT. And, oh, well, uh, 34s, ladies and gentlemen, that, that's, that means at APD that that brings everything. 
Yeah, it's code for cops. It's 10 code for cops, but that means everything. Listen to it. He doesn't want the ambulance. He wants 34s. When are the officers getting here? I've been gone all weekend. She's been dead at least a day. And then just a few hours later, when he starts talking to his cops, I've been gone all, you know, gone for days. Not even gonna come home. You know, I just, I, I left Albuquerque and I went straight to Mama's. You know, and then I decided I, I was just gonna drive by the house later to see if it was dark. Cause you know, I got worried. Got worried when Mama told him. Guess what? She called in sick. But even he realizes, oh crap. That meant no one was going to find her, and the next people coming in that door are his kids. And he left that gun for protection because of that truck theft. And that's why. He makes it clear. He left it there because of that truck theft. And over and over again, oh, he doesn't use words like alibi and those things, but listen to that. He's telling them how this has to be a suicide. It couldn't be anything else. Left his gun, says he showed her how to use it. Just start blasting. And remember that when he's talking about stuff, he's telling you again that when he got there, there's no lights, he couldn't see. It was just that little TV. Oh, you know, yeah, he testified a couple days ago. Oh, just a few seconds, I came in, I turned on the light. Doesn't say anything about that when he's talking to him. Oh yeah, I got worried. I turned, came in and there was black. I turned on the light because, oh my God. No, no, it, it was really dark. I couldn't really see. He claims to have touched nothing. You're going to test, but I don't remember. But you hear him say, oh no, I, I think I shook the blankets. Did he really shake the blankets? He, he, he didn't. That remote's just sitting there. Right by her hand where it's fallen. Where... Oh, well, we've got these fingers, because and that's consistent with shooting the gun, says Wetley, or is it more consistent with falling asleep watching TV? And make sure, hey, I was, look, Deborah, I was with someone all weekend. Yeah, with her, we now know yeah, those photos and records show all night Friday. But Saturday night. Oh, it's because I kept getting those calls and that was embarrassing. <laughs> Always gets calls. But it's off. And it's not just off for a few hours. And you'll look. Oh, there's a few other times where it's off for a period, a little period of time here and there. You're never going to see that kind of time period where it's off for 13 hours. And, you know, there's a reason openings are not testimony, because you were told that, oh, uh, you're going to be able to be, show that he was never there by triangulation of his phone. No, you're not. You heard the defendant testify under oath in his deposition, which he tells you here, oh, he hadn't prepped for it all, even though it was a wrongful death case where he was the defendant and he had two attorneys there. But he hadn't prepped at all. But he also tells you in that one that uh, he had opened a private account just a few months before Tara's death. And that, that Glock, it was kept in that green armor. And you know what? Yeah, I threw that armor in the dump. Now, comes in here and he tells you, oh, well, it was only after offering it to the court of us. And he 
got seven or eight texts from Tara the day she died, but uh, he deleted all but one. The, the one that mattered, he kept. Yet you can't. How do you keep it? You either delete them all, because they don't mean anything to you, or it does matter. It is something you want kept. Because you all have cell phones, you know how it works. You can either do the nice easy one, delete all, get rid of everything, or you have to go one by one to delete them. Well, if you're doing it, why are you keeping that one? In his deposition, he tells you, oh, he purchased that ring by the end of 2007, and that he and Heather were intimate by the end of November, and then married us soon after her divorce to Steve Hendy. See that picture in the phone? All of them are animated. It's December 31st, or excuse me, December 23rd, 2007. And then there's the wedding. From Regina Sanchez to Heather Hendy. Gina Sanchez. Back in October 2006, then it moves in with her. Another break with Tara, moves in. Tara, you heard her test by Tara learned of that one. Called her. Not very happy. Then it was present. Shortly after that, he's out of that house. But he's still wanting to have sexual relations with her as late as November 21st. And the reason she remembers that date, because that's when she tells him, no, it's done. I've got another date. I've got another man I'm going out with. We are done. And then November 27th is when how to kill someone is looked up on the computer. <laughs> oh, it's for martial arts. Rose Slama. Not the most sophisticated. Yet, she supposedly tells you everything you hear from her or changes to, at that civil deposition with no cops present as opposed to because now she's under oath because, oh, she's got charges pending and she thought that was going to, to help her. So let's get this right. She, she's willing to make up a story to help herself, to lie under oath and make up a story to help herself, and that story is not the defendant confessed to me. That story's not, hey, look, this is exactly how things happened. That story's not, oh, when Tara told me about the truck and I told the defendant, he said, look, I did it, but you know, keep quiet. It's just a money thing. No, she even tells you, tells them. No, actually, his response to her was, Tara doesn't know what she's talking about. So let's see, she's currying favor, willing to make up a story under <coughs> oath, and yet she then goes, oh yeah, the defendant denied it, that's not, really? Well, she does tell them and tell you <laughs> under oath that Tara told her that the truck was not really stolen, She's going to report it, and then she went, she being Rose, went to the defendant and told him. Once again, and in this case, if she's making it up, doesn't tell him both parts of that. And that was clear. She tells him, hey, Tara's talking about that your truck wasn't really stolen. And you do have a phone call to the insurance fraud bureau about a truck that wasn't really stolen. But the callback number is Style America.
And she also tells him about the fact that the defendant was in the shower when the shot came off. And that makes a lot of sense when you think about the evidence at the scene. He wasn't in the shower when the shot went off, but he did take a shower after shooting his wife and left that damp towel on the back of the love seat. Now remember, we don't care if the truck was stolen. It does not matter. This is not a trial about trolling a stolen truck. That's why you've got the instruction that says, hey, you're not to concern yourselves. It, it's not for the truth that the truck really was stolen. Don't care. What it's used for is that Rose Slama told the defendant that Tara was saying that. And that that is a motive for her to be killed. Deborah Romero. Bennett, with her all weekend, other than when at work, she tells you, and God knows you heard however many times she was tried to get to say, oh no, he had to have been there within a certain period of time. I don't no. The only thing I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, is that he was there before it got light. And you know what? That makes sense. Because she also tells you, as opposed to what the defendant told you, that that's the first time he'd slept over was that weekend. What makes sense? Yeah, you are going to be more likely to wake up if you're just expecting someone for sexual relations. They're stopping by, you're making sure you're going to have contact that night because they're going to leave. But if they're staying the night, especially the second of the two nights, where the first night they've stayed, they're there, they're there when you wake up, you have to spend time together in the morning, the next night, you heard her, she goes to bed early. Well, it makes sense. She goes to sleep. And then you wake up. We've all done that. Uh, I don't know what time it is. You look at the clock. Oh, dang, it's four in the morning. And that's why she told you over and over and over again, I cannot tell you when he got there. Ms. Garvey talks about how to stop the cell phone from forwarding. Cell phones are a little weird in this case. I mean, here, oh yeah, I, I had the, another phone way back when, the defendant tells you that, because the number pops up, it's totally different than what he had. Uh, but I changed that because I was getting prank calls. So I changed it. Also, the phone I had that night the night of Tara's death, well, it had a warranty type issue and I had to send it back to Verizon. Verizon doesn't have a record of getting the phone back. But even more so, you've got them hooking up for a sexual relationship just weeks after Tara's death. And not just having a sexual relationship, but back at the home, 11 Ash Place, back at what at least at one point was the children's room. Because she tells you very clearly, no, we had to go to the right. You've told, been told about the layout of that house, even the defendant testifies. The master suite's going to the left. She told you it was not a master suite. And they had to go to the right. And he told her the kids were home. <coughs> Where are they? But I mean, she also talks about the fact that she saw nothing that appeared to belong to Tara. Now, she didn't go throughout the house. It's not like it was a search or a look or that's what she was even there for. Once again, Joseph Cordova has also told you everything's boxed up with Tara's within days. And then there's Heather Hendy. 
November 14, 2007, she sends that mm, Detective Chavez with homicide text. She tells you it's talking about marriage. 24 days after Tara is killed. And supposedly, within just, they, they met just a couple of weeks before that. So in maybe six weeks, she's still married and they're talking marriage with no contact prior to that, except a phone call back in May. And not just talking marriage in November, but a ring in December. And, oh, but the defendant, I'm heartbroken about all this, you know, from the beginning. Here's just one day in these phone records from afternoon until nighttime. Calls between the defendant, Deborah Romero, and between Heather Hindi and the defendant. On November 1st. November 1st. And it's just a day. Please go through them. Look at them all yourselves. Especially when, just days after this, the defendant's telling him, I have no more tears. Everything will be over in a week. Get over it. And everything is boxed off. Oh, but Tara was looking to get out of the barber business because her, her feet hurt. You heard about the detailed plans. You've got the sketches of opening her own barber shop. Does that sound like someone who's getting out of it? Really? Okay. Then that November 5th, 2007, where the defendant drops in to talk to Aaron Jones. Remember, you heard that, it's here for you to play if you wanna hear it again or again. What's his concern? He wants that computer back. Very beginning, that's what he's wanting. And why isn't this investigation closed? Oh, for, and there'll be nothing on that computer. Oops, I think the phone raised. But I gave it to you, why don't I have that back? drops in and he says, when questioned, and you heard it, that he was seeing nobody steady and he wouldn't even know their last names. Heather Hindi sends that text to the defendant discussing marriage just nine days after this meeting, but he's not seeing anybody steady. And then you've got the computer. You've got the how to kill someone. You've got the all the time, the, the, the porn and the, we don't care about the porn. Who cares other than it shows those patterns. Oh, and hey, the uh, defendant says, hey, look at some of this. I, I, I wasn't even, I was at uh, work on those days and I never took the computer with me. Remember when Officer Brookerson was on the stand talking about the computer? And does that on cross over and over about all these dates? Pick one date. Say, look, it's all military. It's all, it's a union. That's what the pattern is. Hey, look at the phone records. They show he's in Albuquerque. But he never took the computer with him. So did he leave his phone up there? Thousands.
thousands of files on that computer have been deleted between October 14th and 15th. cell phone research, including which phone's the most secure. But he says suicide. Suicide. That text at 129, I'm afraid I'm going to hurt myself. I'm so upset, sad, and hurt. That's why this has to be a suicide. Bunch of other texts he might have gotten, but they got erased. Okay. Lots of phone messages. Just erased them. And you know what? She's made these threats before. By God, that's why it's Sue. She made these before. But even he has to say, yeah, but there's never been any prior attempts. Nothing serious. And even with all this, I left that gun there for her protection. Oh my God, even after he testifies to you that he's worried and wants her to get treatment, because she seems to be jealous of their daughter. And yet, he's still going to leave that loaded gun that, according to him, she's never touched that gun. Still going to leave that where he wants her to get treatment because, oh my God, she's jealous of the daughter, besides the depression. Really? Man, it takes balls to suit yourself. And she didn't have it in her. But man, this was suicide. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, nuts. They're supposedly such a big deal. Let's deal with this one sitting here on the table. I'm sorry, Lee. <laughs> You've seen the journal. You've seen and listened to it to the, the statements about her writing and how this goes on. So she's going to take the time to go get that gun out of the cabinet, to send this text. And that's the note she leaves? Picture of her kids right there, and it's not, I I'm sorry I couldn't do this. I love you more than anything. Or, and notice, it's a nice, neat writing at the very top of a new spiral notebook with the pen laid down neatly. Is she starting a new journal? Is she writing something? Is she doing, we don't know what that is. Even Dr. Berman says, can't say what that is. But ladies and gentlemen, you get to use your common sense and that's not a suicide note. And then there's the one in the trash that keeps getting made a big deal of. So she's going to kill herself. And she writes a note and tears it up and throws it away and buries it under stuff. Because that's what it has to be if it's a suicide note. Because we know that that party hat was there from the 12th of October, a week before. And that the party hat and the cold medicine and the razor stubble's all above that torn up note. Real hard to get the razor stubble to stay above a note if you're shoving it in there. But and it's torn up. Dr. Berman doesn't want to, talk, to, to admit this at his clinical practice. But people write notes to vent and tear them up. People keep a journal to vent to get their emotions out so they feel better. And speaking of that diary or journal, those are the last parts of the last three dates in there. Those are not, oh my God, I'm going to kill myself. And note that the journal stops in July. We have nothing to suggest any kind of problems after that. But it's, I finally figured out, Levi's Levi. I got to take care of myself. I'm going to move on. I'm going to figure out my own things. Look through the whole journal. Yes, the stuff before then. There are things in there where she's clearly, I mean, she's upset. She's sad. Surprise, surprise with the husband she has. But that, 
That is how she ends it. The last word on there. Happiness. Now then, even McCann comes in and tells you for the defense that, hey, when you're looking to see whether it's a staged crime scene as opposed to actual suicide, you look for the inconsistencies. You look at the fact that Tara's cell phone is plugged in across the room with missing messages and not next to her. Oh, but, oh, it's plugged in because, you know, that little table right there, it's got too many things to plug it in there. Really? It's not so much that it's not plugged in next to the bed, it's that it's plugged in at all. Oh, but that was feminine touch. The damn towel. Everything else, look at the photos. Towels are hanging up neatly. Except for the damp one over the back of the love seat. Men's shorts on the floor. The guy's been gone since Wednesday. Hell, it comes in here and he tells you basically he's been gone for good that month. Oh yeah, he came off and on, and, and yeah, he might have slept then because that picture shows he's sleeping on the bed on the 10th of October. And so yeah, Tara, he'd still be there some. The rest of the house, yeah, there's some, but really, look, look at just the room. There's nothing else just laying on the floor. Well, telephone, but that's left from the phone call to 911. You got these shorts. You heard Art Ortiz. You know what? I don't have the Betty. So I can't tell you for sure. But this is inconsistent and weird. Oh, but it's wicking, according to McGann. Please look at those photos. Look at them closely and see. Oh, it's pressed down here and see. Really? It's from two different areas. Yeah, it starts up there, but look at where it is. You take your time and look at that. And really, this one. Does she appear to have shot herself, or does she appear, absent obviously the gun shot wound, to have fallen asleep watching TV? We all have spouses or significant others or have had. You spend a lot of time with them. You know their patterns. My wife falls asleep with a book quite often. Lay in there on her. So when you walk up and you look through the window and you see the little TV on. Late at night. What are you expecting? But the remote is sitting right there. Just right there. Her feet are crossed and relaxed. Defendant tells you, oh, her feet cross when she sleeps. That's the only symptom she has. How is she laying? And then, probably the ultimate inconsistency in all of this, if she's killing herself because the defendant doesn't come home, the next people coming home are them. That's who's going to find her. Unseated magazine. No photo tells you yes or no. You heard Mark Radosevich not trying to BS you. The photos, because we don't have a true 90 degree angle, cannot say yes or no. Oh, the fence shows the one from this way, yeah, that's going to tell me a lot. But supposedly that one tells you it's seated. There's a reason angles matter in a photograph. 
But what Mark Radosovich talks about is how, looking at these, he went, hmm, that's a possible problem. And he went to find out more. And there was a round in the magazine. But you heard what happened. Uh, we'll talk some more about Mr. McCann. And what the evidence is, that Glock does not chamber a round when the magazine is unseated. Yeah, this might be a good time for the bathroom break. Well, we can go uh, uh, 10 minutes later. Now that you the experts in this case, it doesn't matter how many, who, what, uh, th those, you could make a decision. What I want to point out, though, is that every expert that came, yeah, it's too small, you're not going to read it all, but uh, every single person who came for the state was coming for just their specific area of expertise. They weren't trying to be everywhere. Contrast that with the fence experts. You alone are the judges of the credibility of the witnesses. That's so key, and that's the whole nature of the system. The jury determined what to believe, period. And the part I, I, I want to concentrate on is when you listen to that, it's not taken in isolation. It's not, oh, you were on the stand for a day. And based upon that day, everything comes out this way. It's in light of the evidence, in all of the evidence in this case, for every single witness. Mark Radosevich. Not as straightforward as you can get. Here's what I know, here's how it works. This gun. This one right here, not some other gun that was used, but this gun right here takes more than five pounds of direct pressure on the magazine report to release it, <coughs> period. A glancing blow doesn't do it. Oh, falling down and hitting the remote, that might do. It takes five pounds more than five pounds of direct pressure. And that gun, that gun, which he tested, will not chamber a round if the magazine's released. <coughs> and, oh, well, the only person who could release that or says that magazine was released was Aaron Jones. Well, think about how the testimony came out. Who actually had the concerns about the magazine release? It wasn't Aaron Jones. It meant nothing to him. He wasn't a gun expert. It was icky. I had to pull it out. That's what he was concentrating on. It meant something to that man. And it began to mean something to that man before he ever knew anything, when he started to look at the photos. This could be a problem. But I don't have a 90 degree photo. I can't say based upon the photo it is. So hey, Aaron, who, who removed that magazine release? Oh, I, I, or excuse me, who removed the magazine? I did. Yeah, and uh, how'd you do it? Actually, it's kind of icky. I had to just pull it out. But you didn't have to use the magazine release button? It's not like Aaron called him up and said, hey, hey, guess what? That magazine. It, I got your report. I know you didn't mention anything, but hey, did you know that the magazine was, un, was released? It was the other way around. And then it was a combination of what Jones told him, that bloodline that he walked through with every single one of you and explained, and the photos that led him to come in here and tell you unequivocally his opinion that magazine was released.
But then you got Mr. McCann. <coughs> who would tell you lots of things. Started talking about cadaveric spasm and but yeah, yeah, I, I'm not a pathologist, you need to talk to a pathologist. And then both pathologists, uh, you know. He tells you, well, he did these testing and a gun, this Glock will, or a Glock, not this one. He, they, they were able to do the testing and get it to one, I can get it to release in one mo motion. Got another gun. Sure didn't get this one. Doesn't know what the pounds of pressure on that other gun. Doesn't know. You sit there and watch him. Uh, some days I can do it. Really? And oh, another gun. We, we Upside down, we managed to get it to chamber around. Talks about some video, but then never shows it to you. And... Even then, though, he talks about, yeah, but see, based from this, we have to, another person had to hold that gun steady so I could pull the trigger. You heard all sorts of talk from Mr. Radosevich about the whole issue of the limp wrist and how that gun is designed with the recoil for a firm setting. Otherwise, it has a good probability of a malfunction such as a jamming, not loading another round, being unable to do what it's designed to do because the energy is not transferred like it's supposed to. <coughs> and then that whole feminine touch thing. Plugging in the phone was some kind of feminine touch and therefore explainable. But then, obviously, the kids coming home to find you, yeah, that's a problem. He was your ultimate jack of all trades and master of none. What do you want to ask me about? I'll give you an opinion. As contrasted with Mr. Ortiz, who told you many times, look, based upon this, only opinion I can give you is it could go either way. The crime scene itself, these photos, look, they don't say one way or the other. But here are some concerns. You know, I got this elliptical possible blood drop. That's concerning, but I can't even tell you it's blood because the bedding's gone. So based upon the photos, nothing at the scene rules out homicide, nor does it say the photos say it couldn't be suicide with the photos alone. But if there is a smoking gun in this case, it's the unseated magazine, because that just doesn't work. <coughs> and oh, Ms. McCann talks about, oh, there's no signs of struggle, so oh my gosh, this couldn't have been anything but a suicide. He tells you of his own, come on, in uniform, bring up, take my gun off, talk. Doesn't mean anything. You're a cop. That's what's expected to be seen. You have a gun. You take it off. You deal with it. It's part of the process every time. So even if she was somewhat awake, walking up with a gun, doesn't mean anything unless it's a stranger. Dr. McFeely. The body itself does not say suicide or homicide. Either way, injury could go to both. And if there were any other injuries to the mouth or lips from a forced entry, they would have been obstructed from the additional wounds from the blowing up of the gases inside of the mouth. She was very clear. Yeah, there's some bruises, I, I, but I can't tell you if there was other. Oh, well, there might be something here or here. Of course, you're not going to cover up if you've got, but if your mouth's open and it's in, yeah, you could get some bruising. You could get some, but when it then blows up itself, it's covered, and that's what she says. Don't know. Maybe there's chipped tooth, maybe there's not. 
wouldn't have meant anything because it could have happened either way. Talk about that recoil on the slide. You know, and, and that's the, the funny thing. And you've got the picture of the tongue. And look, look at the tongue. Even Wetley talks. Look at how big that is. And then you've got the sight on top of that. It's fairly sharp and rough. And, and so if you're doing it upside down, way back in your throat, how come the sight's not cutting your tongue? And very, very simply and very, very concisely, the uh, Terra died instantly. No way she could have put any pounds of pressure on that magazine release. She could not do it. Dr. Wetley, <coughs> the magazine release is a question that needs to be answered. But then he ignores it for his opinion. However, I'm still going to tell you it's suicide. Yeah, we need to answer that question. And I don't know what that answer is, because oh yeah, you, you guys have heard lots of things, but it'd be a question that needs to be answered. But no, it's suicide. What? <laughs> really? That's a question that needs to be answered, but I can still come in here and give you that opinion? And then he's the one that talks about that it's got to be all the way in the back of the throat based upon the injury. Once again, that is more consistent with someone forcing it in than you're doing it yourself. Really, you're going to gag on the thing? Oh my god, I'm about to shoot myself in. Or are you going to be... Lana Williams. Venom's DNA on the gun along with Tara's. However, <coughs> Tara's could be from the blood. She could not tell. She attempted to avoid the blood, but she told you over and over again. Problem is, there's lots of blood. It's flaked off. It's, the handle's going to be hard to see. I don't know. And so that she gives you the very definitive statement, you cannot tell from DNA whether Tara Chavez shot this gun. DNA alone cannot tell you that she shot this gun. And that is her definitive statement when asked. And then there's that other stuff. Oh, there's the the, the uh, sweats in the in the laundry that, you know, there's no semen found. And then there's a couple of hairs, hairs that could belong to well, one hair. Based on DNA, can't even tell it's human. Probably is, but you know they did have a dog. Um, and the other hair, that it's a male, but it's any male in the world based upon the DNA testing. So don't know. And that's just the testing. I have no clue how long they've been in the washer. Bateman, FBI. Really doesn't, you know, does her job in downloading the phones, tells you things. Mainly what she tells you is, hey look, you know, that, that uh, the pink phone, the, the Motorola, the one that was prior that the kids were playing with. You know, yeah, there's all these messages that Tara sent. There's absolutely no inbox, no call, there's nothing else left on that phone from, from message wise. There's just her messages. There's some photos, there's some, but from message wise, there's just her messages. And, you know, if there's these other texts, well, they're not showing up in Tara's phone at the scene. Why not? She tells you they're, they're not in there. You've got the stuff, please look at it. They're not in there. These seven or eight texts just to Levi aren't in there. There's two. And she talks about all the videos in there and you know, they're just videos she watched. So I'm just like, you know, the defendants, you know, in early October, Tara's taking a picture of him in the shower, or a video, a little video Could of him you in the shower. Please, please, I'm sorry to interrupt your uh, presentation. I really didn't want to do this.
big deal. Video, October 3rd. Only reason Finna tells you he's basically been out of the house for a month. Yeah, you've got that video, you've got the one where he's sleeping on the bed on the tent. Put that into effect. Shirley Garcia tells you she does print. No usable prints. Can't say whether the gun was wiped or not. Alina Sanchez, ballistics. Casing is seen. It was fired from that block. Mr. Citizen, Finnan's phone cannot be accounted for over 13 hours on the 21st of October 2007. Period. It's asked. Nothing in these records can account for where his phone is. And even the last time it pings, that last tower, he was asked specifically by Ms. Keener. Yeah, he checked on that tower because they're all somewhat different. Could have been three to five miles away in any direction from that tower. Dr. Berman, you determine what weight to give, but gosh, everything seemed to be a factor for suicide. You write a note, don't write a note. You act on it, you don't act on it. But even he tells us, can't say what I'm sorry Levi means, I don't know. No clue. And begrudgingly admits that people do write things to vent. Hey, you guys saw that in this case in a whole other manner with the whole Captain Cupcake Share shithead that Aaron Jones put together. It's not something that people don't do. We all hope we don't hint sin. We all tear it up. But it gets the angst, the anger out. But why? Why would the defendant kill? Well, one, as you saw all the way back in October 2006, when he's shamed. When he's out of Regina Sanchez's house because Tara calls and isn't very nice. And then. He's looking up how to kill someone. No, 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 that was for martial arts. Okay, they're holding him back. You know, you got, he didn't do the ball and chain, doesn't even know how. But he does not open his private bank account. <coughs> Tells Tara things that are not very nice. Obviously, Dr. Berman talked about those as part of his decision making. And then the defendant tells you on the stand that really he'd only go back to Tara because he feels sorry for her. Oh, and sometimes I missed her. And divorce is looming. And then there's Heather. Didn't meet till October beginning, and you know, you heard about the trips, the money, the marriage, text, the ring. Does it make any sense, especially in this situation? Someone who's been cheating, wife's dead, and within days, we're looking at marriage without having any kind of contact before that? Does that make sense? That's why you have to use your common sense when going through all of this. And determine what makes sense. And there is money. $100,000 insurance policy on Terra. It's not new. Nobody's ever come in here and said it's new. But what is interesting is that You've got the benefits, military benefits, being looked up on the computer multiple times. You saw that when Brookerson testified. Even going back. And then you have a change in service. And it's just months after joining the Air Force service. You heard the testimony of the, the guard. And 
It's a changeover. You know what? No, it's there. But I don't know about And he even kind of talks about it on the real rancher stuff. Oh, I don't know if I have it or not. It's not the kind of question you can call and ask. Hey, do I have life insurance on my wife? Uh, and is suicide covered? But you can look it up, and then you can go make sure you got it. And there's that kind of like, oh, he didn't have a car, but the truck's been gone for a month. But that cat he's bought just days after Tara's death. And obviously divorce is no longer an issue anymore. And the money that goes into it. And you heard about the, the money happened to pay Leo Rancho. And then there's Nick Wheeler. Been intelligent, didn't have a clue. So he does tell you mom had heard rumors. And he explains his version of the whole you saved my life to Andrea Lucero when asking. Andrea Lucero told you what she heard. An awful strange thing to say. And he was really surprised because, by God, Tara was obsessed with him. Because <coughs> it was all about him. You heard, you saw. What he wanted went. Pack up and leave. I'm not dealing with this. She's obsessed with me. I'm going to have all these affairs. And then finally, he's got to shut her up. Once again, it's not about a truck theft. But the fact that Tara says that he's involved in a fraud. And he knows that is a problem. Because if she's saying that, what happens when APD hears that he's involved in some kind of a truck fraud. Whether it's true or not, doesn't matter. What, one of our officers is involved in some kind of a fraud? Okay, we gotta look into that. And he just transferred there. He tells you, oh, probation, that means they can get rid of you. You hear everyone else, oh, but I wasn't really on probation then. He kind of catches himself. I was, because it was a lateral, I was, you know, they could just send me back. Mm -hmm. Credibility, you judge. And let's look at the credibility of Ben. Let's look at what he says versus what he does. Just a few places, because we all know actions speak louder than words. Says he never took the laptop with him to work. Does admit to looking up for military sites, APD union information. You heard from Brookerson. We went through that date. Yeah, the phone records show that based upon these things being looked up, he'd be in Albuquerque. But he never took it with him. Can he delete? I says, I don't know how to delete temporary internet files. But he does know how to search computer, how to find all sorts of things, all of which were deleted. Remember, Brookerson talks about all these things we're looking at were the items that were deleted. He does testify under oath in the civil case when asked if he cleared the internet history on the APD computer, not on the home computer, but asked specifically about clearing internet history. I don't remember now. I don't know. Not, I don't even know how to do that as he comes in here and tells you guys, I just don't remember if I did it or not. He says he looked up how to kill and how to rip out someone's throat in regards to some type of martial arts. No evidence he either enrolls in some kind of martial arts or falls through on the computer looking for a particular type of martial arts.
And where are his phones? Oh, he tells us he had that different number because of a prank call. Doesn't know what happened to the phone. And then that phone that, that would have been right at this time, which we never have. Oh, it, it had to get sent back because of some defect, even though there's no record of that. <coughs> and he has an explanation for everything. Now remember, he's the only witness who saw, heard, read, and was present for every piece of evidence presented over the last five weeks. And now he has an explanation for every possible inconsistency. <coughs> but you have to determine if what he tells you is credible. Remember, bias, interest, manner while testimony, testifying, reasonableness in light of all of the evidence. And which story do we look at? Just one piece. Testifying for his jury. On 71013, when I was an aviation policeman, she shot that gun. And then he goes on multiple times to talk to you about how Tara never shot this gun. It was only the aviation gun. At the deposition on 31109, actually, I don't remember if she shot that gun or the one from aviation police. And at the scene, Tara's death on 102107, when he's talking to law enforcement, when asked about the gun at the scene, yes, that's my fucking, I showed her how to fucking use that gun. But, you know, he's a changed man, ladies and gentlemen. After this, he, he's a changed man. You've heard about the women and when they come in and how they play out. Oh, uh, Rose, what's going on? And A, uh, Tara found out about it, but I still kept having an affair with her for months. Regina Sanchez, Tara busted. You know, oh, but I didn't go back and look at the phone records. How often he's calling Deborah after the death. And obviously everything about Heather. But he's a changed man. He's changed for his jury. This is not suicide. It's not. It doesn't add up. This is murder. The defendant did kill Terry Chavis with the deliberate intent to take away her life. <clears throat> and he walked into that house and shoved that gun into her throat and pulled that trigger. A bullet in the back of her brain so he could move on. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no such thing Even that thin blue line cracks. And people begin to realize that something's wrong. 